three of the most senior aides that he had, including somebody who's meant to be the professional head of the, you know, the neutral civil service, had a pathetic little WhatsApp group together and they were just bitching about the prime minister yeah. and his wife, dare I say, when they should have been executing what were the difficult judgment calls made by him and the elected cabinet members at the time. That's the real tragedy of this. After nearly 18 months and tens of thousands of pages of testimony, the COVID inquiry finally gets its star guest today and tomorrow. Yes, Boris Johnson. We'll bring you full coverage of that over the next two days here on Times Radio. It all starts at 10 this morning. He entered the building of the inquiry at 7. Will Boris Johnson repeat his performance before the Privileges Committee where he was outraged by the accusations he had lied to Parliament? You did not ask. I asked. I did say this is complete nonsense. I mean, complete nonsense. I asked the relevant people. They were senior people. They'd been working very hard. They gave uh, Jack Doyle gave me a clear account of what had happened. The cabinet secretary. How the cabinet secretary wasn't there? Sorry, you're wrong because I did ask the cabinet secretary. That was Boris Johnson clashing with Bernard Jenkins during the Privileges Committee investigation into Partygate. But that tetchy appearance didn't work out for him. So will he take a softer tone today? One of the men closest to him in his last days in office was Gitto Hari, Director of Communications at Johnson's Number 10. And I'm delighted to say he joins us now. Morning, Gitto. Good morning. Uh, what are you expecting here? Because you, you know him, him well. And he, 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 has no, he can be very emollient. He can be very petulant. He can be a big showman. He can pull it back. If you were advising him, what would you advise him? And would he listen, do you think? Well, he commissioned this inquiry. He feels very strongly that it needs to get to the root of the matter. Nobody got all the judgment calls right uh, anywhere around the world, to be honest. Mistakes were made uh, here and elsewhere. And he genuinely wants the inquiry to get to the root of uh, the issues so that whoever is in situ next time anything, uh, God forbid, remotely like this happens again, uh, we'll all be better placed for it. And he's going in there with that very constructive, positive attitude. Does he recognise, do you think, Gitto, though, that it looks like a shambles? I mean, if, if you showed anyone's WhatsApp messages, it would look like a shambles, I think, because people tend to be franker in WhatsApp messages than they, they should be. But even that notwithstanding, Gitto, the thing he's being charged with is just a lack of control, a lack of discipline, just being victim of chaos. And that's been very, very evident in the, in the WhatsApp messages that he didn't want to disclose. He hasn't disclosed all of them. Will he address that, do you think? Uh, you said it. If, if people heard the sort of conversations in editorial meetings rather than what you put out, you know, all polished on Times Radio, it would be a different kettle of fish if people, heard, if people could eavesdrop on anyone's private meetings where, the, where it's vital to uh, clarify the issues, to challenge points that are being made aggressively sometimes, particularly when the stakes are high. Imagine listening in on emergency services or on the armed forces or sometimes medical staff in the middle of a very traumatic period, not to mention a newsroom. So I think, you know, the, the WhatsApp messages, of course, they're, uh, they're pretty, you know, kind of, uh, uh, they're, they're not great to look at at all, but that's not what the core of this is. 90% of what Boris Johnson has handed in to the inquiry shows that decisions were taken, whatever the debates around them, at formal meetings with officials present, with the relevant ministers present, and they were taken in good faith based on the knowledge that was available at the time. It wasn't all perfect. There were mistakes uh, made, but they were, on the whole, people acting in good faith in difficult and unprecedented situations. Does he have an ideological position to defend here, do you think? Do you think he wants to make a case for... Because in some ways... If, you're, if we're being our most charitable, he, he sort of trod the entire gamut of locking down quickly, locking down slowly, locking down um, at the early stages, challenging the idea of locking down in the later stages. He's really, by looking at his evidence, had all sorts of different opinions as he got different advice on the subject. Do you think he has a settled ideological position he wants to advance uh, today? Well, I think the problem is a lot of people assume that there's this, you know, wonderful, clean, neat, objective thing called the science. And if only the idiotic, you know, petty little politicians could get their pretty little heads around it, we'd have all lived happily ever after. Not the case. The science changed. The science uh, was conflicting and changed on whether we should wear masks or not, whether we should shut down the borders or not, whether schools should be open or not, the method of transmission. There's a whole load of things where the science changed and scientists argued amongst themselves. And that's just one part of the picture because, you know, he had all of that from health experts. On the other side, he had people who were worried, rightly, about the economy crashing and the economy crashing 
also has an impact on lives. We see the suffering these days from that. And only one man sat on top of all the relevant considerations, having to weigh them all up. And of course, in that situation where you were making essentially, this was a 400 billion pound call to shut down the British economy. Anyone who does that lightly without yeah. sort of having second thoughts about some things and challenging aggressively what's being put to him is not fit to be there. I take that point, I guess, but who is the one person who told us there, there was one such thing as a monolithic science? It was Boris Johnson and his ministers. I mean, I was we, we, we launched Times Radio during this period. The number of times we heard we're following the science. It wasn't the scientists saying that. It was Boris Johnson and his ministers saying that. That's what I think can, can, can sometimes frustrate people. People, he's quite right to challenge the science now, but he tried to sell us this monolithic view of the science at the time. Well, he was trying at the time to get, you know, when you when you have to get 60 million people to behave in a certain way, you have to sort of persuade them that this is not just optional, but this is something that's really in their interest to do. So, of course, the scientists were being pushed to come up with something as credible as possible to resolve their differences and dissents sometimes. And I, you know, I know there are scientists out there who feel that rogue scientists, not the right word maybe, but yeah. scientists who disagreed with the orthodoxy did not get a, a hearing from the other scientists. So again, this was a lot messier. But in the end, Britain ended up sort of about midway in yeah. the global table of horrors in terms of how well or badly we handle it. We did get the vaccine, not only invented, but rolled out faster than most people, and our economy bounced back quicker than most people. So I think we've got to avoid today thinking this is a sort of Christmas pantomime where there's one villain and we all want to shout boo at him because in the end that will do us all a disservice. Boris Johnson will not be the Prime Minister next time there's a crisis like no. this and it's critical that big lessons are learned for whoever will be in his or her shoes. Would you, get to, you know the man, would you trust him to, 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 to run the country again? Would you trust him to run a company, run a bath? Would you, would you, I mean, what's your levels of, uh, of trust for him now? The tragedy for me is that three of the most senior aides that he had, including somebody who's meant to be the professional head of the, you know, the neutral civil service, had a pathetic little WhatsApp group together and they were just bitching about the Prime Minister yeah. and his wife, dare I say, when they should have been executing what were the difficult judgment calls made by him and the elected cabinet members at the time. That's the real tragedy of this. He do you think they let to, him down, Gitter? Do you think he was let down by his advisors? I do. He was let down um, very badly by them. But uh, my understanding is he's not going there today to set low scores like that. Let let those bygones be bygones. He's going there with a constructive attitude to help the judge come to the right conclusions about future action. We'll see if that's what happens. Gitter, good to speak to you. Thank you for joining us. That's Gitto Harry there. He was Director of Communications at Johnson's Number 10. Really articulating the pro-Boris position, I think. They're more sinned against uh, than sinning. Uh, anyone would have struggled in that situation, and he did no more uh, than that. Uh, he was, of course, the man who put a uh, country into lockdown three times, and Partygate saw him become the first Prime Minister to be sanctioned for breaking the law. He's giving his evidence. He wants to be constructive, according to Gitto Harry. Do you buy it? Will you believe him when he does that? Times Radio will bring you all of his testimony live along with analysis of what it reveals about his handling of COVID-19 and what it means for the future. That's Boris Johnson at the COVID inquiry today and tomorrow live on Times Radio from 10 o'clock today.